All right, happy Saturday, everybody. Thank you for coming to the uh, last session. Woo -woo! I figure we'll start with just a silly video. This is pre-release. You guys get exclusive access to something that we are working on. And as we let people kind of trickle in, this was my, this was my, you know, kind of basically try to get everyone out of the singularity next door by playing puppet music. So let's enjoy this for a few minutes while everyone trickles in and then we'll get started. sneak peek <laughs> some of the things that we're working on and I've got a bunch of other crazy stuff that we can have fun with today because I figure if this is pre cocktails right we should at least be having some fun all right let me see if this is going to work hmm hmm da -da, da -da -da. okay cool so um I'm Kate Goldman, I'm the CEO and founder of the Cybermaniacs, and you might know us um, as the fuzzy puppet people who bring joy and love and all sorts of crazy creative approaches to security awareness. Um, and some people have called us a reverse mullet. And I'd like to actually talk about the back of the mullet today. So a reverse mullet is where it's party in the front and business in the back, right? And so what I wanna talk to you guys about today is the party in the front is the puppets and the crazy approaches we do and the interactives and we basically throw any kind of spaghetti at the user to ensure that they actually love the experience and that they connect emotionally to the stories and what we're trying to tell in order that they change their mindsets and their behaviors. But I wanna talk about a little bit today 
is what's behind that. So what's the Ferrari engine underneath the fuzzy exterior? And a little bit about why that is so important to organizations and programs today to start thinking about this differently, because there's a big seismic change on the horizon in terms of how we work in organizations and how we work with our humans and how we actually look at the risk around humans, and that's sort of what I want to dig in today. So I really want to talk about, I'm actually going to, I have to flip this, this is not the right thing. I'm going to back up for one second. Hold, hold. You think it's all, and then is it going to work this way? You ready? See? It's going to mirror my display. Is anyone from IT here? <laughs> I don't think I'm going to get my notes. No, it's not the internet connection. It's the how do I keep my notes but play with the big thing. Shh. Nope, I think we figured it out. Ready? Have you tried turning it off and on again? So we're going to. Yep, hold on. Wait for it. See, but now it's not asking. Oh. Yeah. You gotta switch them. <sighs> okay, wait. So now this one needs to go in which direction? Probably. Don't look at my desktop. It's like a mess right now. Other. Which way? Other way. Other way. <laughs> Amazing. See, I tried to play the video in the beginning and this is what I get for my this is what I get for my talent. Da -da -da -da. And present. Presenter view. <laughs> yes. So now this one needs to be big. Yes. 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 Success. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. All right. Fantastic. So let's do, where's my, nope. Nope. You got to come back over here and then you got to go here. Wow. That was intense. Okay. So. You might know us as the reverse mullet, and we're going to talk about the data. And I guess where I want to start the story is, is sort of where we started with the content and then what led us to keep pulling the string and what we found along the way. Because even, I think there are lots of things that you can pull from this that I want people to understand that you can actually implement these things at your organization. Um, and what was critical for us to get this right. So I think we've heard a lot today. It was really interesting from Kate Keene's talk and from um, Bob West talking. Everyone was talking about culture and everyone was talking about the importance and the imperative of the people, getting the, the board on the bus, getting your team on the bus, getting all the employees to have a security mindset. And the thing that sometimes frustrates me and the reason I love CornCon is because I'm going to lay this down and I'm probably gonna say some things that might tick people off but I'm really getting to the point where I'm like, we keep saying culture in a presentation and saying we should do it, but do you actually know what it is? And do you know how to measure it? And do you know how it works? And do you know how to leverage it for success? Or are you running off a cliff and you didn't even realize it? So there's a lot here that we've heard today about this, and I think we have to kind of pull it apart and start looking at it. And so that's what I'm hoping to do, because I think the imperative is that with all the change we're going through in terms of digital transformation, cloud adoption, et cetera, on the micro and the macro level, we really do only have one chance to get this right. And since I know the culture and the behavioral and the people part of the equation is as important as the technical part, of what we secure and how we protect it, we have to get these things together. So I think it's critical for everyone to kind of get up to speed on these approaches and these disciplines and what they mean and how do we integrate them into the fabric of what we do in security. Okay, so rather than think of 
humans as a problem and, and, and rather than think of things in terms of, you know, crush your human risk, I want to embrace it. We like to say we're the only cybersecurity company that you can hug because you can actually hug us, and people do when we go to events and stuff. They take selfies with our characters and they actually hug us. But I think it's also a question of how we need to embed this and really drive this into our organizations and make it part of the hearts and the minds. And I also think when we look at human risk, human factors risk, and, and how we look at the people in the organization, we also need to think about this as a capability and a competency within the strategic objectives of security as a whole. So when we talk about board level metrics and we talk about how we're actually talking about our um, ability to deliver a cyber capability, business level risk, the human side of it needs to be part of that as well. And frankly, we're running on some pretty old metrics that don't actually tell us where the risk is, what kind of risk we have, and how to fix it. Because I don't know about you guys, but I don't think phishing simulation tests tell you that much. Does anyone disagree? It's almost like a medieval alchemist, right? It depends on how you write the, the phishing sim and how you work it, and then it depends on the culture of your organization. Do you have a no-fail culture? Do you have a blame culture? Are there toxic elements that you need to, to take a look at? So, so there's a few things that we need to unpack here in terms of you know, how some of these metrics and how some of these things are at the organization. But the one thing I will say um, is that I don't think current approaches are working. And so this is part of this shift that we're seeing in the industry. Security awareness in and of itself is changing from a tick box, one size fits all, slide deck of death, compliance driven um, kind of exercise within an organization into a program that is much more dynamic and focused on different psychological, cultural, and behavioral um, of challenges. So I like to say that if you have the traditional level of training that you're going to put your employees into trainees, which is the malaise that often comes from compliance training. Right? And so it's simply not working year over year when we look at what's happened. I think we're chasing the wrong thing. And what I really want to fight against is it's not just that the, the content boredom or the fact that employees don't love the push-based compliance training of the past. I think it's also that sticks aren't necessarily working with the demographic changes we have in the workforce. So if you look at some of these seismic shifts around um, demographics, if we look at how some of these things are actually progressing in terms of the nature of work, where we work. So let's talk about what the silent res resignation, are we still calling it that? Where people are leaving, that does affect your security posture, right? If people are mentally checked out, if they don't have that security mindset, if they're not fully at work, present and productive in their jobs. So there's a lot that's actually changing Right? And we know that the fear, guilt, shame isn't working. We know the sticks aren't working. Um, and I will say that what's underpinning some of this stuff are these larger changes and so our approaches to how we work with humans and how we embrace our human risk has to change as well. So for a fun fill in the blank exercise, right? Um, I think when I say you are the weakest link, I don't mean you as a human. And I don't think that humans are necessarily the, 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 weakest, way, the, the weakest link. I think humans are not inherently risky. So, so let's, let's throw down a little challenge thing. We put humans into risky situations, right, because of their jobs, because of their roles, because of the technology stack, because of the work we're asking them to do, because of the data that they have to interact with, right? But I don't think humans are actually the risk factor. Does that make sense? So I think if we start to flip our thinking on this and we think of how can we use humans as protective agents, how can we have them be rapidly adapting cyber defense agents for the organization, the first thing we need to do as an industry is stop saying these things, full stop. You know, humans are the problem, human error, exactly, right? These are the things I think that we need to challenge fundamentally because when you put a human into a situation, there are elements of risk within it, and then there are certain things that a human may or may not do that could cause problems. But rather than blaming and shaming, 
right? And putting our users and our learners and our employees at the center of that, how do we actually flip the switch? And I think the challenge we have here is that humans are actually a huge vulnerability for the organization. And I think the biggest reason they are is not because they continue to make human errors. I think it's because we have a lack of visibility and transparency into what they do and why they do it. And so I guess my question is, if we can go out and look at every single thing that's on our network and we can measure it for security, why don't we have that same sort of visibility and transparency into the human elements of our organization as well? Right? And I think the thing is, is that the science is actually there to start doing this. So an interesting fun fact, while we are a crazy puppet company and we do tons of entertainy fun things for your employees, the company was actually started with a behavioral scientist, an organizational anthropologist, and a brand manager. Right? So it's not your usual kind of startup uh, cyber awareness company that comes from a different space. We actually started from the perspective of how do we weave these behavioral, psychological, or what I call psychocultural influences into the content and into everything we do because it has to be the bedrock of how we get humans onto the bus and how we get them thinking about this. But it's our lack of understanding into who our humans are and what they do and why they do it, and as well as our lack of capability in this space at the programmatic level that's causing some of these challenges. But I do think we can get past it. So when I look at this and I look at the human risk and how it works in the organization, let's talk about humans for a little bit. I like to call them your h volns. Okay. Thank you for everyone who got the office space reference. Right. And, and I think, it, you know, I want to frame this in the sense that we need to know who our people are deeply and intimately, right? We need to understand them comprehensively. And what I like to just simplify it is, look, I need to know what you know, think, feel, and do all around digital, all around information, and all around information security. Um, and so by using some of these measurements, you can actually start to look at soft indicators of how people operate, what they do, why they do things, and why they do it in different contexts as well. And in our dynamic kind of working organization, that's really important, right? So for one of the, you know, for one instance is, you know, in some of the research that we are doing, looking at people and how they operate, we did a whole series of studies around remote work. And the thing that we found most fascinating was the type of employee that is the most compliant, right? Who gets their training done on time, who follows the rules, who doesn't have any red flags, all great, in an office is actually one of, the more risky org one of the more risky employees when it comes to remote working. And the reason actually is when you start to unpick that, it's got a question of what is your comfortability with ambiguity in your working style preferences. Does that make sense? Yep. So those who are more open to ambiguity who can kind of go, okay, I'll figure it out as I go along as long as you give me sort of those agile compliance guide rails are actually more secure in a remote working situation than the people who memorize the rules and always want to do things but need that sense of certainty and need the level of detail and understanding. Because what did we do during COVID? We threw them into remote work and most companies said, good luck. So that's one of the reasons that we saw the effectiveness of attacks go up so much within the human you know, space and why most humans were victims and vulnerable to it because we had a lot of employees who knew the right thing to do in the office, who didn't know the right thing to do at home, and then we had a lot of people guessing. So, so those are the kind of ways that looking at these psychocultural factors can start to bring insight into how do we then remediate that? How do I understand the scope and scale of that? So we are actually working with companies to say, well, let's talk about your workforce model. Let's talk about what are your new remote working rules? Are you going to be full remote? Are you going to be back in the office five days? Are you going to be hybrid? Because there's a big difference psychologically for workers in terms of um, if you're going to do the scheduled days or the flexi days. Do you know what I mean? Right? So it, it's how you're going to then approach how they operate securely, what you train them on, what they need to understand, and how you set them up for success goes hand in hand with the conversations you're having with HR. And so back to what was said this morning in a lot of the other presentations, it is a team sport and how we get cyber at the table and have these conversations and relationships is really important. Right? And I think here's the other thing to think about human vulnerabilities is there's actually a very big silver lining to this, which is the same psycho 
psycho psychological and behavioral factors that you can identify, measure, and, and understand in terms of your organization, in terms of risk. You can also flip it and look at it in terms of designing very targeted and super effective interventions because you're giving people the type of content and the type of understanding that doesn't cause cognitive friction, right? That actually helps them learn faster. So you can accelerate your culture development, you can accelerate um, your risk reduction because you're actually specifically focusing on the vulnerabilities and the types of psychological underpinnings at the same time. So that's one of the things I think that's most fascinating about the model is that it can actually go from two things. How do I accelerate that culture transformation? And at the same time, how do I understand where my risk is and how my humans are actually doing? And so the one thing that I'd like to then frame in terms of this understanding of human vulnerabilities and our deep knowledge of who our people are, what they do, why they do it, what they know, what they think, what they feel about security, right, is we're really trying to focus right now, a lot of the tools I see out there focusing on is at the point of impact. What did they click on it? When did they click on it? Right, and I think that that's way too late. So my challenge is, how do we get as, I guess, far left of that as possible? How do we get into um, preventative and protective um, interventions before they even happen? And it's not like minority report. You know, I don't want to get <laughs> necessarily start arresting people for these things. Maybe. No, I'm serious. But how do we actually get to the mindset shift the needs, shift that needs to happen well before the click even takes place. So the focus on the impact is too late. You know, we can't nudge them after the click. We can't nudge them right before the click. We need to go farther and farther and farther upstream to actually think about changing mindset and culture on a micro and a macro level. So one of the things that we're looking at putting together and we're conceptualizing is your secure humans operations center, or as I like to call it, the shock, right? Which is similar in your security operations center, right? But what is the human aspect to that? So how do you actually do, you know, how do you look at your human protective factors and your processes and your data across a psychological and cultural element as well as the technical sides? Right? How do you actually start to look at your digital tribes and how people operate within your technology sphere from different lenses so that it's not only role-based, it's not only function-based, it's also how you operate, where you operate, what you're doing, what is the job to be done. And so there's lots of different lenses that we can put along this to start bringing out the, the risks and starting to look at creating highly targeted areas for intervention. Because by using these approaches, what we've been able to do is to find very surprising areas of risk that organizations had no idea existed because they treated everybody as a one-size-fits-all. So there was always, well, everyone did their training, so we must be secure. I got a show of hands. Anyone think that that's actually true if we finish our compliance training? Does that? Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. It's like, my employees can define malware, therefore totally covered, right? So how do we actually use these different lenses to start looking at these things? And what we found is that you can actually go in and start to find highly targeted areas. And so we did, for instance, an assessment for a major manufacturing organization over you know, 30 different countries, um, over 50,000 employees. And what we actually found was that the assumptions from the security team in Europe in the head office about what the competencies were, what people knew, what different departments understood, and how they liked to work were in direct violation of many of the policies that they had written and actually showed significant skills gaps in areas that were direct threats coming externally. So I could say, look, you know, in Asia, in this specific department, in this specific role and group, you've got this problem, which is actually going to make you more vulnerable to a ransomware attack because these are the behaviors and the traits associated with it. And so that's the thing is it's about challenging the assumptions and starting to build a remediation plan on data and on facts, not just on saying, let's just roll out the training. I'm sure it'll be fine. And so those are some of the things that we're looking at. So from a you know, human protective factors and some of these individual development elements that we're starting to look at are things around your cognitive preferences. Um, how do you like to learn? What kind of information do you consume, right? 
Nobody likes to read anymore. Does anyone still read? See, I know, love you guys. There you go. But when we talk about training, we talk about on a digital screen, right? It has to have different types of styles. There's video, there's interactive. So my question is, for each individual person, how can I best get into your brain without creating friction? Right? And so then we also look at things like, what are your preferences? What are your personal preferences? What do you think motivates people more? Compliance or my personal life? Don't all say it at once. It's okay, I can't. Oh my God, the noise. It's crazy, right? So we know that what's in it for me, people are more motivated. So how do we actually frame the same exact cyber learning that they would need for your policy in terms of a personal preference or in terms of who they are? Uh, we also look at knowledge and competency and personas across all these different elements. And so by using those cultural positive factors, right, you can create a holistic picture of exactly where you are, and then you can layer in the other threats. And so when we start to look at this as a organizational capability, right, you need a place to go in and look at these things in depth and to ask the different questions because just like trying to solve a different vulnerability at your organization, you know, one graph is not going to show you the answer if only, you know, complexity were that easy, if that makes sense. Right? So how do we actually look at these different things? Because what I'm trying to eliminate is the UHPs, my unidentified human phenomenons. Right? So a behavior in the information security sphere that doesn't seem to have any real cause. Where did it come from? Why is it happening? Is it happening over and over again? Is it a specific set of users? Is it because of knowledge? Did they just not know the right thing to do? Is it because of a poorly designed front end and it needs some UX judging? Right? Or is it another reason altogether? So unless we start to pick these things apart and have these things mapped out, right, it's just an UHP, which doesn't actually allow us to address the risk at all. And so again, by using some of these um, techniques, we've had really surprising results. So um, another example I can give you is phishing, um, running through phishing policy and helping an organization um, in the oil and gas industry, what we were seeing was that the policy was written within the European sphere and they were trying to roll it out globally. And the click rates, when they did do the phishing simulation, varied greatly by region. And so they were saying, well, how do we target the other regions? Because it seems like the people that are on the bus within the European region are great. I'm not as worried about them, but what I'm worried about is that 30% rate that I see in Latin America and Africa, and how do we actually start to address that? And so what we did is by using these cultural and by using these psychology approaches, we took their policy and we flipped the script. And we actually translated it, in a way, into language and into signs and symbols and values that made sense to the employees within that organization. And what we saw was that by using the right channels of communication, by using the right signs and symbols that, that were valued within that subgroup, I would say, of the organizational culture, that went down 30% overnight, just because they finally heard us because we were finally speaking in a language that they understood. Same policy, same guardrail, same compliance. It's just thinking about communication and thinking about how to do this from a more targeted way so that you actually connect the first time. And look, this is not new. I'm not inventing anything from that perspective because marketing does this to us all the time, doesn't it? You know, the advertisers know how to use emotion, they know how to give us personas, they know how to target into different groups, and they know how to give you the right message at the right time to buy the toaster. They always know, housewares, I will buy them if you put them in front of me. It's terrible. So how do we use that same thinking and those same approaches within um, cyber awareness to get our employees on the bus too, right? And another one we can talk about is how you frame the why. So one of the things we heard this morning from a lot of the other presenters was ensuring that everybody understands why we're actually doing this, having the board conceptualize cyber risk as a business risk, using the same cultural levers are what you allow you to do that and drive home that learning um, much faster than if you're speaking a language that people don't understand. So if this is the new frontier, of securing the human, right? Behavioral science, psychology, organizational anthropology, and neurology. Like all new frontiers, it is fraught with buzzwords. And so I hear the word culture a lot. 
And I keep on being like, so what does that mean? What do you think that means to you? Okay. Um, culture is not a buzzword. And I would also caution against the word nudge. Has anyone seen an uptick in the word nudges lately? Yep. So again, these are the kind of things that just because people are saying that, oh, we use nudges. Well, okay, how, when, why, with who, right? And so all of those details actually matter because just because you nudge somebody doesn't mean that um, there's an actual framework behind it that's gonna show you the vulnerability as well as do the interventions. So I wanted to do a quick breakdown of organizational culture for you and give you some rules of the road. And I'm happy to share these slides with anybody who would like to, to take a copy of them. Because I think one of the things that I always find lacking when we start talking about culture, and since I heard it again today, I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna put a couple slides in there. We're gonna actually get into the meat of what it is because I want you guys to go back to your organizations and be able to speak about this and the need to measure it and get your arms around it from a cybersecurity perspective. A lot of times we go into organizations, um, we get a little bit of pushback from HR because HR feels like what? What do they feel like, you think? They feel like they might own culture, right? And so that's the challenge is culture is everybody. Culture is everyone's. And so when we talk about relationships and we talk about going up there, part of getting on Team HR and making friends, right, is about speaking their language and showing how using cultural approaches in cybersecurity is something that you guys can do together, right? So culture is the shared knowledge, beliefs, behavior, outlook, attitudes, values, goals, traditions, and practices. So not too much at all. It's totes. It's easy. You guys can do this in like a day, right? But what I think is really interesting about this is culture can also be the engine of human adaptation. In a lot of ways, it is like our software layer, right? Because it's through creating shared group understanding that we actually developed as a species. You know, has anyone seen the TV show Alone? Yeah, it's, it's crazy. I don't think I could do it. I don't think I could do it. But that's the thing is I keep on thinking about, man, they have to build the house all by themselves and then they have to go out and hunt all by themselves. And we work better as a team. We are social animals. We were raised in tribes. This is how your workforce is going to work, whether you like them or not, right? So how do we actually take that and use that power that we have to help them adapt to this new digital environment that is going so fast? It's like being in a convertible with no sunglasses in your hair, it gets all the bugs in it, and it's kind of crazy. Because I have been on this roller coaster for 20 years working at the front lines of enterprise IT, and I will tell you, um, it is absolutely bananas. And I can understand why most human brains, if we bring a little empathy to the table, please, your employees' brains hurt. Because we keep moving their cheese. Do you know what I mean? Right? And, and human brains, what do they like? Cheese. <laughs> I like cheese and wine. Don't move my cheese, right? Because we are habitual beings, right? And we create habits because of a number of different things. Do you want to know the main reason that humans create habits? It uses less calories. Because when you think you burn more calories, and so one of the things we adapted to over time was learning something, putting it down in memory, sharing it as a group, saves me time, saves me effort, saves me calories. So how do we actually take this and use this magical power to help them adapt to what they need to do, whether that's a policy rollout, whether that is a new um, launch of a product, whether that is a different way of working, whether that is starting to recognize new attacks and the way they're coming into your business faster. That's one of the things we hear all the time from almost all our clients. How can I get information out to my employees faster when something has changed in the external threat landscape? Do you guys agree with that or disagree? Because now I'm going to be audience interaction in the last half an hour. We're going, to get, we're going to get the neurons firing. What do you think? Yes? Right? And so here's the challenge is, it's not just how you put out that information. You've got to put it out in a targeted, really highly impactful way that they instantly know what you're talking about. Does that make sense? So that's the challenge that we have is that if you know who your people are and you understand the deep culture elements, values, symbols, etc., 
you can craft something that helps them adapt faster because you're not using friction, you're not going against their brains. And so when we think about culture, there's many different layers to it, and they're all interdependent. It's like a crazy Venn diagram. And so what we're trying to do is unpick these so that in different categories, and I just threw four up there just to kind of give you an idea. You gotta think of it like the rings, right? But in your closest circle, you've got yourself, right? And then you've got probably your family, really close friends, right? In one circle, you have coworkers you like. In another circle, you have coworkers you don't like. Kidding. I know you guys like everybody, it's true. Okay? But then as you kind of expand out at the macro level, then you're going to have company. And so this is one of the challenges we have when we talk about organizational culture or behavior change, etc., which is if you're not moving the levers closer to the person psychologically, you're just going to be spinning your wheels. Does that make sense? So that's how using these blend of approaches saying give them the personal information that they need to be more secure because that's what they care about in a way that they understand, but then also start layering in the organizational culture on top of it. These are the spheres that everybody operates in. And you can measure them and understand them. And that's the thing is then you can start to understand what's more important, why it's more important, and how all these things work, right? So when we talk about culture, your company has a culture. A lot of times I hear, well, our security culture. I'm like, da, 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 da. stop it. You have a culture, you have an organizational culture, whether you like it or not, whether it was purposeful or not, I highly encourage you to make it purposeful, but um, you can't have a security culture. It's not something separate and distinct, right? And so when we talk about organizational culture, people are still kind of confused as to what it is. It's kind of like the way we kind of do things here. And I think that's a really simple way of doing it, but why do you do things the way you do things? Does anyone know? <laughs> Somebody told me to, right? But part of it is because we inherit these work practices, right, from other places. So one of the things that, that kind of I learned this lesson very early on when I was you know, out in the field and doing business process analysis, and I had to sit down with people all day, every day, and watch everything they did and record every keystroke and ask them about their business process and where the data went and why the data went there. And then there was always a question, why are you putting in the date into the other field? Well, because they didn't give me a field for date. So now I'm using the field for you know, company code, but I'm putting dates in there instead. And we wonder why we have data quality issues. So much fun. But at the forefront of that, I watched the frustration of normal human beings trying to do their work, trying to get the job done. Right? And so when we think about that from an empathetic perspective, people are going to share what works, aren't they? And so that's how we learn as social animals, right? We work together as a team. How do we bring down woolly mammoths? We shared information, we're like, now look, if we drive the thing into the, and then we go over the cliff, and then Jim, you're the lookout, because you're the smallest, right? No, I'm just kidding. Okay. So how do we actually do this? So it's the way things work around here, and we learn that socially. We learn that through stories. We learn that through someone when we're new. How hungry are you in for this information when you're a new employee? Yeah, you're like, how does stuff work around here? Because you know the employee manual and that crazy three days of videos they put you through doesn't really explain that, does it? You know, how do the power structures work? Who can actually move the levers? All these things actually matter. The most important thing on this slide is that culture is a carrier of meaning. And I think we talked about a little, bit, a little bit earlier how important some of the meaning behind the value of what we do in this industry is not resonating with the board. They still don't get it. They still don't able to conceptualize it because we have to create that shared meaning with them. That is what tribes do. We all agree that this means this. A chair is a chair. Right? This is what our business risk is. And so our job right now is to start using these methods and practices and levers and power that we have to create that shared meeting with our organization, with our boards, with our teams, with all of our employees, because the truth of the matter is it's affecting them all personally. So the great, you guys have so much, there's so much good stuff out there. Because it's not like everyone's like, oh, I don't know what cybersecurity is. What is cybercrime? I've never heard of it before. This is shocking. Right? Everyone's aware of it, right? So 
we've moved past awareness. Now everyone is either scared, they don't know what to do, they don't know how to do it, they don't want to face it, they feel like it's too technical, it's too complex, I couldn't possibly understand it. Sometimes we don't help with that. We have a lot of jargon, technical terms, things that sound scary. And if I see one more picture of the hacker in the hoodie with the matrix background, I think I'm gonna hurl. I think I'm gonna hurl. And I'm, I might do like an award every year, like you know how they have the Razzies? I think I might just start handing out like worst marketing crap ever um, because we can't shame or scare people into this because you know what people don't like? Pain. Really, we do not like pain, physical, emotional, right? I eat my feelings, it's okay, we'll talk about it later. But we do not, so humans, you're humans, everyone at your organization is gonna move away from that. So how do we create this new shared meaning in a way that doesn't hurt people, right? In a way that actually makes them want to get onto the bus with us. And the other thing is, it is dynamic, it can be changed, it absolutely can be influenced. I'm not saying it's easy, it won't happen overnight, it won't happen with one slide deck, right? It won't happen with one training video, as good as mine are. I'm saying, it's true, right? But when we think about that, how long does some of this strategic change take? It's gonna take months, it's gonna take years, and you're late. And I mean that in the nicest possible way because I love you all. We gotta go, it's time. So here's the thing is the impetus is behind us, the, w the wind is at our sails, and now is the time to start really um, tightening up the sheet and getting some miles underneath us because this is what's important. We have to shape it by incentives. What am I gonna get out of it? So I, when we work at the user level, right, we have, okay, I'm not gonna do games because leaderboards suck and most people don't like to play. Not the way we're forcing them. Like just because you do like sort of an arcade game and you try to make it interesting, people don't care. Normal employees be like, all right, ding dong, ding dong, ding dong, right? So there's only a very specific subset of people who like to play certain types of games. So if you want to design incentives that actually move your organization in a certain way, you have to understand what they're incentivized by. What kind of rewards or perks work for them? And from all of the measures we've done and all the studies we've done, we've been doing this for 20 years, it's all over the board. And one of these things makes it really unique and it will change in your organization. If you work for a global organization, what motivates teams, I will tell you, in different parts of the world is very different than the individualistic money-based rewards that seem to work so well here, right? They would rather have a team party. They would rather have dinner for their families. They'd rather have, right? You gotta understand who your people are and then you can move that culture and reward the good behavior and the people that are modeling the things you want them to model by giving the incentives that matter to them. Maybe it's money, maybe it's a day off, maybe it's a parking spot, maybe it's prestige, maybe it's some swag, maybe it's just a quiet handshake and a thank you. But if you don't know who your people are, you can't actually deliver that. So it's key to supporting change and you have to learn it and you can learn it, but here's the tricky part. It's like an iceberg. I mean, everything's like an iceberg, right? How many times have you guys seen an iceberg slide? Woohoo, it's the iceberg slide, I used it again, okay. It's like an iceberg. Here's the thing is, we think of culture as this observable thing, it's not. It's all under the surface. So you will have company vision, and you will have values and you'll have things printed on the wall and those do matter and they should matter and they should be well written with action verbs if possible. Trust is not a company value. Does that make sense? How do I, it's like, you know, be trusting is something that we can actually ask people to do, right? So these structures, these management systems, how people get paid, how people get punished, HR documentation, all observable culture. But I will tell you what you're gonna have to do is start to figure out what is underneath the system, what is underneath the surface. And those are the deeper characteristics. And if you nail those, that's how you get to sustained change. So you're gonna have to go out and actually dig for this stuff. This is the stuff that people will tell you but no one will write down. And you can get it from surveys and you can get it from analysis and you can get it from tons of different ways. There's a bunch of different measurement methods and I'm happy to talk about it for like hours on end because I find it fascinating. But you have to find it. It's not going to come up and present itself to you like, hi, I'm organizational culture. It's nice to meet you. Let me tell you all about myself. You've got to go ask a lot of questions and then you'll get a lot of answers. But all that shared purpose, all that meaning sits underneath it. And you know what's even more interesting? Anyone been in a company that's gone through an M&A that went bad? Was it because of culture clash? 
Oh, yeah. All right. So back in the day, in one of the uh, earlier iterations of using some of these different models, I've used these cultural models for things like agile transformation, doing a going from waterfall to agile in terms of software development, but doing it based on the team psychology and their cultural underpinnings and will they naturally be more agile in their thinking rather than based on the project. Because everyone's like, oh, you need to only do agile based on new software we've never built before. I was like, yeah, not with a team that doesn't want to work agilely. Does that make sense? Still going to fail. But the other thing is with M&A. Right? If you actually look at an organizational culture, you can, you can measure the amount of friction, effort, and cost it will take to bring you into a hole. Right? So there are lots of different ways that these approaches have been used in the past. And the reason I tell that story is because this stuff works. And I know if we start digging into it in cyber, we will see the traction we need to get because it's worked before. I have actually done entire outsourcing contracts and we've given the winning bidder to one who had the highest points in the RFP based on cultural alignment because I knew my team would be working better with them. It would be a natural, I could get to storming, forming, norming like overnight. I didn't have to be like, hi, this is this person and they like to work this way. It's like everyone kind of gelled. Now that doesn't always matter. Sometimes you need different capabilities but what I needed was speed. And so I didn't want to spend a month playing the get to know you game. We just needed to go. So culture, values, alignments, all those things matter. So I'm gonna give you a couple quick rules of the road and then we'll have some time for questions. Um, the first thing is tribes are natural. You have tribes, you have groups and subgroups. And I call this ants on a baseball because sometimes the differences are really small. It's not gonna be profound. You'll, you might have a homogeneous organizational culture, but it's in the differences between the groups that we start to see where the friction is or where the values actually lie, okay? So it's not one thing, it's still being, it's still kind of how we, how we call our people our own. Okay, so you have to think of things in terms of culture and groups and affinity and tribes, and they are natural. We have a model called digital tribes that I can get into at the bar at some point with anyone who's interested of the, how we actually look at your organization through a lens of the people and the way they work and how they adapt to technology change and what that means for their cybersecurity risk overall. But there are different things you can use to get so much traction to understand who you are and what that means. So you gotta think of this like your humans and your culture is like your human safety infrastructure. And that's why I say we have to understand this and be able to measure it and model it and monitor it and look at it for indicators and look at it for change points on a level that no one has even conceptualized yet. And that's what I'm trying to build because that I think is what is the most important thing. We've got to understand our humans. I mean, I don't wanna say you wanna go out and sniff your humans. Like, you might sniff your network, but maybe. I know, that's gross, okay, fair enough. Don't smell the humans, they're terrible. Okay, but again, how do we actually do some of these things? Um, before you build culture, you have to understand what you're actually building on and what you have, and this is one of the biggest mistakes I see. Everyone's like, great, let's build a culture. I'm like, slow your roll. <laughs> you are not ready yet. Let's start with baby steps, and baby steps are start to understand what you have. Pick a model to understand it with. There's probably five or six relatively good organizational culture frameworks that you can just pick off Harvard Business Review and start using. And even if you do a self-analysis and bring your team together and go, what kind of culture do you think we have? At least you've got a left or a right or an up or a down and you can start looking at it. So one of the things we used to influence our model was Hofstede. And his model is very deep and there's so much writing on it. You could be, you could get a PhD in some of his work. But so there are proven models, so it's not all woo woo, that you can go out and start to say, well, are we more individualistic or collective? Are, how do the power dynamics work? How do people respect authority? You know, how should we actually communicate? You have to understand what you have and then you can start to say, where do we want to go from here? What is the vision for ours? And where do we see security fitting in? Because you will not fall into the fire swamp if you understand that first. Everyone's like rodents of unusual size. They exist. You will get bitten by them if you don't know what you actually have. The other thing I want to warn you about, and I don't mean this to throw shade on where security awareness is right now and some of the other people in this space, your culture is not a score. 
Anyone who's going to give you an 8 out of 10 on your cyber culture score based on a one-page survey you fill out online as a marketing lead, please do not take that to management as any sort of remit or understanding of what you actually have, I beg of you. Um, it's going to be more complicated than that, and you're going to have your own unique thing. So think of it like a painting. You might be a Picasso, you might be a Monet, you might be a, I don't know, throw out your favorite artist. There we go. So how do you actually figure that out? It's not a score, it's a painting. Think of it differently. Don't let anyone railroad you into that. This is not something you can benchmark. It's something you have to define because you need a map, right? So the definition of strategy, right, is Right, the Greek word strategy, it's a military term. You've got to get me from here to there. My goal is to sack Rome. How are we going to get there? Mountains, rivers, lakes, army, crossing, archers. What do I have? Internal capabilities, external capabilities. You need to know where, how this all works because you can't figure out how to get from A to B. You can't even write your cybersecurity human risk strategy unless you know this. So think of it like a map. How are you going to create your map? And then how do you know what resources you need to move along the map? So think of it differently, not just as a score or a benchmark. And I will also argue that it's going to take a lot more than a tool. And we'll talk about resourcing in a second and the need for increased spend in this area. I mean, everyone wants more money, budget resources, I get it. But how much money is spent on cybersecurity every year? What's the market at right now? 600 billion? Somewhere around there, is that what Gardner's saying? Yeah. We spend less than two billion on education for our humans. So the studies come back over and over again. I know some of it's marketing hype, like 80% of breaches were caused with a human error at the root. So we spend what, like 90% of our spend, 99% of our spend on technology stack and almost nothing on the users. And so my argument is, look, you know, you want results? You might have to think about this differently and we're going to have to create more um, program maturity in this area, and so you have to think of it like a program and not just a tool. Slapping in an e-learning platform will not solve the culture problem. Do you agree or disagree? There we go. So again, if anyone comes to you and says that my platform can give you culture, you may laugh. I encourage hearty laughter, okay? And again, back to the shared meaning. You have to create shared meaning. How do you actually attach value to it? How do you move people onto the bus? You really have to think about that, and there's, tons of different techniques you can use, and I can go into them forever, but think about how you pick specific words and how you actually get people to agree with you and move forward, because it's all about creating a shared vision in the mind. Okay, here's another pitfall that I see all the time. Thank you, Tony Robbins. Um, you know, you get what you tolerate. And I think this has a lot to do, one of the things we hear from customers and from people we talk to in this space over and over and over again is blame culture, no fail culture. Is that familiar, does that make sense? People in the back, yes? Seriously, so that's, it's like, well, what happens if the organizational practices and the way that we work involves hitting your employees with a stick whenever they fail a phishing sim? Okay? You know there's entire Twitter feeds where people offer condolences to other workers that they have to go into remedial cybersecurity awareness education training? It's like they've gone to juvie or something. They're actually like, oh, I'm sorry, man. Oh, that's the worst. I, ooh, got caught out. I got caught out of phishing zip and I have to do training. It sucks. Okay? But you get what you tolerate. And this is where the partnership with HR comes in. And this is where understanding positive behavioral psychology comes in. Understanding where you're going, which is you have to address this head on. If it is an individual manager, you have to find a way to address it. You have to coach them into saying, how do we keep our employees secure? Part of it is you being secure. Part of it is you helping them and coaching them into better security behaviors. But if you let the toxic things fester, and if you don't actually call them out and solve them, that will not go away, okay? You get what you tolerate. And so if there is something along those lines at your organization or within subgroups, you have to, you have to call it out because you will not fix it systematically if you don't. And the cost of not doing it is huge. So like we said, failed mergers and acquisitions, failed takeovers, there's entire books in the business library about CEOs who've come in and tried to transform companies and totally didn't even look at the culture. We're like, I'm the leader, I'm gonna come in and do whatever I want. And does it work? 
the employees just sit back and go, yeah, I'd like to see you try, right? Okay, so culture clash can be extraordinarily expensive, and so there are business cases you can point to, written by fancy people with MBAs that have real numbers in them about how expensive culture clash can be. So if you need to bring some ROI to the table and you need to have a conversation about investment, business risk, understanding our human risk, changing the way we think about it, there's probably six horror stories that you can give them with lots of millions and lots of zeros at the end that if you don't pay attention to it, measure it, and do it well, you will end up um, taking longer and failing harder than you ever thought possible. So I'll leave this, um, and then I think we have some time for questions if anyone wants to have a chat. The most important thing that I see lacking right now with most organizations I see, and this includes the Fortune 500 and some of the big people we talk to, is a lack of vision for where they want to go in terms of securing and protecting their humans. I think there should be like a human protection officer like a DPO, right? Not a human risk officer. We're embracing our human risk, we're hugging it. We're gonna give it a lot of love and attention. So how do we actually build the vision for change? I'd like my security awareness to be better is not a strategy. Good enough is not a strategy. So it does behoove you to put this at the CISO level, right, and at the board level even, to say where are we going with as we transform our workforce, as we change and dynamically grow as a company, how do we keep our humans secure and continually on the bus? Because as we said early, it's not a journey, there is no end. It is a continual cycle of awesome, okay? The second thing is, if you don't know your humans, please don't start. Start by knowing your humans, just take the time to understand them. Go into the data sets, go into the questions, get into the competency. Are there knowledge gaps, are there skill gaps? Is it a belief issue? It can't happen to me, right? I watch those numbers change as users are on my platform and as they go through our personal dynamic learning experience. That is the metric that makes CISOs the happiest. When I can actually say, actually, after nine months, we've gone from 60% of your population believing it can't happen them to zero, right? Because we told the stories in the right way, we made it resonate, and they start to get it. That is the beginning of a mental touch point. Kate showed that graphic earlier with the denial in the beginning and then how you go through. You can put each individual user on the same kind of flow. You have to know where they are. You have to meet them where they are, and then you can start to motivate them forward. And then we train, we train, I don't like the word training, but I'll use it for here because it was shorter, but you have to change it up. You have to think about delighting your audience, right? Because who likes blue and gray PowerPoint slides for like three years in a row for learning all the things you should do in your job, yeah? There's tons of ways to delight, but I would say, I think everyone in this room believes that we can't do it through fear, guilt, and shame. And then you have to think about how to build and grow your program. And so every single company we talk to, we talk about there is no staff out there. I read security awareness job descriptions, and just like the rest of cybersecurity, I'd like to inform you that they also read like unicorns. Because you're not gonna have someone who has a degree in learning instructional design, and also is a statistician, and also knows how to do data modeling, and also has a research psychology degree, and also can write music and videos and produce them, and, 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 and. And I'm like, this is not a talent stack that actually exists in reality. But, and the SANS maturity model last year, they're saying that all organizations that have reached a five, I don't think there really is a five, but that's another conversation, but have four to five full-time employees dedicated to security awareness alone. Anybody in the room have four to five full-time people dedicated to security awareness? Yeah. So we see a lot of partials, we see a lot of, well, done to kind of 10% and 15% here, and that's the challenge is, if you're going to build and grow it as a program and mature it as a capability and start to build it in, then we're going to have to talk about a team and how we bring it together and how you hold the center, and there's lots of different ways to do that, but if you're not on that bus, I would, I would please ask you to go research it and figure out what you can build this year, next year, and how you start putting that plan in place. Because if you wait another 24 months, it will be too late. And then always measure and improve. So it's how do we get the granularity of data on individual people, on pockets of risk, on different types of human vulnerabilities, and how do we meet the people where they at? This is sort of the recipe for what I hope you guys can embrace over the next coming years as we start to make awareness great again. I did it, I said it, I'm sorry, it was really bad. I didn't mean to. Thank you. Questions? I can end with the news desk, okay, yep.
Oh, should we do spear fishing? That one's fun. Okay, spear fishing. Hold on. Spear fishing. Any other questions while I'm pulling up spear fishing? Can she do two things at once, ladies and gentlemen? No. I do not have the puppets with me. They're in a suitcase in an undisclosed location. But I might bring them to CornCon next year because I think the kids would like them, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. We got Cyberinsky, we got Mo Cipher, Wanda Proxy, Professor Protection. Let's see. What do I got for spearfishing? All right, this one. And back over. I got to catch it and I got to move it. Move it. Not that one. That one. That one. That one. No. That one. Yes. Make, play it, make it big. All right, so we do news, we do songs, we do skits, sketches, memes, you name it. And this is what recent news desk we just released on spearfishing. Welcome to Cybermaniacs News, where we bring you the latest stories and news from the front lines of the cyber world. Today's topic, spear phishing. A highly effective type of phishing attack aimed at specific targeted individuals and organizations with the attacker posing as a trusted source. So put that tackle box away because this ain't your run-of-the-mill phishing attack. These are highly targeted emails and very tricky to spot. These hackers have done their homework and they're coming after you. 66% of companies in the last year reported being targeted by spear phishing scams. In a recent story, a man in the United States posed as an executive from a small company in Louisiana, targeted an employee in the financial department who knew the real executive. In an email titled Urgent, the hacker instructed the victim to quickly send a total sum of $300,000 to close on a business merger. The employees complied and immediately sent the money. While the man was caught after trying to make the deposit, not one but two companies were duped. Employees admitted afterwards they were not aware spear phishing emails could be spoofed so well. Free tip, I replaced the word urgent in emails with the word suspicious. Wire me the money, it's urgent. Totally suspicious. So uh, you've got to finish the report by Friday, it's urgent. Still suspicious. I'm not doing it just to be safe. In our second story, featuring a whale. Seriously? Yeah, a whale is a high profile target in spearfishing. Mm -hmm. From hell's heart I stab at thee. For hate's sake I spit my last breath at thee. Ye damned whale. Moby Dick. Oh, yeah, that's right. It's my favorite book. As if. A whaling cyber attack targeted thousands of high-ranking executives at financial services companies. The executives received a convincing email which looked like a subpoena from the U.S. District Court in San Diego. The message included instructions to appear before a grand jury in an upcoming civil trial, with personal details included, such as the executive's name, company, address, and phone number. The message led recipients to download a complete copy of the subpoena, which was, of course, infected with tons of malware. Cyber criminals now use public information such as an executive social media posts, company press releases, news articles, and more to craft crafty email messages. Personally, I prefer felting. Yeah. Mm. And that's all from us today here at Cybermaniacs. Stay safe out there in the cyber world. Yeah, folks, stay secured. Literally just said that. Yeah, but I, I made it sound smooth. No, it's like I finish it. Uh, and you said safe, and I said secured. So. Safe's better. Secure? We're not having this. Cyber secure. Cool, okay. Have a great Friday. Thanks, everybody. Oh, my God, it's Saturday.